So if you haven't watched the impeachment hearings thus far, can't say that I blame you. They did begin in their public phase this past week, but they're just excruciatingly boring, if you ask me. And I don't even say that in the sense that impeachment hearings have to be exciting or have to have a lot of pizzazz to be important. But if you want to pry your eyeballs out while consuming the information that's being presented to you in the form of a case, allegedly as to why the the president should be impeached, that might be a little bit of a problem, although that's a little bit of a superficial angle on the entire matter. But I did watch at least the first hearing in full, and there was a moment in the opening statements of the very first witness that the the Democrats chose to put forward that, of course, got almost zero attention. But to me, was extremely significant in that it sort of set the tone for what I feel the function ideologically of these hearings has been and will continue to be if last week was any indication, which is that by trotting out all these career national security officials and diplomats and so forth, what Democrats are doing is they're essentially exalting as the counterweight to Trump in the most consequential, supposedly, episode of his presidency that could actually lead to his impeachment. They're elevating these figures who have it as their central belief that more or less American foreign policy has been sterling and virtuous, except for this rude interruption by Trump over the summer, whereby some military aid was temporarily withheld from Ukraine, although it really wasn't quite even withheld. And I'll get into that. But I want to show you a clip from the hearings. This is George Kent. This was the very first person the Democrats put to the public in their case against Trump. And he made a rather eyebrow raising comment with respect to Ukraine and the recent history of U.S. involvement in Ukraine. So here's the clip. Ukraine's popular revolution of dignity in 2014 forced a corrupt pro-Russian leadership to flee to Moscow. After that, Russia invaded Ukraine, occupying 7% of its territory, roughly equivalent to the size of Texas for the United States. At that time, Ukraine's state institutions were on the verge of collapse. Ukrainian civil society answered the challenge They formed volunteer battalions of citizens, including technology professionals and medics. They crowdsourced funding for their own weapons, body armor, and supplies. They were the 21st century Ukrainian equivalent of our own Minutemen of 1776, buying time for a regular army to reconstitute. Do you see what he did there? That is George Kent invoking the Minutemen of American Revolutionary War fame as an apt analogy to the fighters and the paramilitary groups, the militias, etc., who were warring against Russian forces in the eastern provinces of Ukraine after the 2014 coup. Now, why would George Kent invoke that analogy? I think if George Kent were sitting in some kind of undergraduate seminar room, and he invoked that analogy, he would probably be subject to greater questioning than he was at this congressional hearing because there are some probably notable discrepancies between the Minutemen of the Revolutionary War era and those militias that he's now valorizing who were active in eastern Ukraine after the 2014 coup. But Kent would bring up that analogy because it serves a certain 
purpose. It has the function of interweaving American historical mythology with the narrative that's being fostered around what Ukraine underwent in the wake of that 2014 coup. So if they're seen as one and the same, if George Kent and people of a similar mindset can present that kind of framing, then that's going to make the case against Trump seem even more damning because he wasn't just withholding any old military aid. He was withholding it to the equivalent of the Minutemen for the purposes of modern day Ukraine. So he's depriving these heroic fighters of the aid that they desperately needed to carry out their valorous task. Well, one thing that didn't come up in that hearing and which very few, if any, journalists commented upon, because, of course, they're all totally enraptured by the cable news fixations around these impeachment hearings. One thing that didn't come up is that those militia fighters, which Kent was exalting as these paragons of heroism, many of them were just straight up neo-Nazis and fascists. And I know the terms neo-Nazi and fascist get thrown around today with such caprice that they almost lose meaning in terms of the terminology. Like I totally understand why if you hear somebody being described as a fascist or as a neo-Nazi, you probably are inclined to roll your eyes and at least demand a little more evidence because those words get flung with reckless abandon in the U.S. political context. But in the Ukrainian context, one reason why we have a fairly good idea that they were neo-Nazis or at least rabidly fascistic, is that they proudly brandished the actual symbology symbology of the German Nazi party. Like, they touted the same symbols. Some of them had swastika tattoos, et cetera, et cetera. And the commander of the unit essentially described their mission as protecting the white races in Europe, et cetera. So there's not a whole lot of mystery there. And those were some of the groups that ended up getting, quote unquote, aid allocated by the U.S. Congress. Eventually, in 2018, after several years of that aid being dispersed, the U.S. Congress, partially because of the advocacy of Ro Khanna, who should be commended for it, cut off that aid and prohibited that any funds they dispense for assistance to Ukraine it was prohibited that that would go to this particular group. And the name of that group, if you want to look it up, you don't have to believe me, is the Azov Battalion, A-Z-O-V. Go look up their ideology and tell me if you think that it's a great idea for the U.S. to be plying those individuals <laughs> with assistance. So George Kent maybe didn't know, although seems like a relatively smart guy. He has the bow tie and everything, so he's probably a capable individual. So I have a hard time believing he didn't know about this whole issue of the Azov Battalion. So you got to wonder how much more blatantly can you whitewash what the U.S. has done in Ukraine since 2014 than to depict the people who have been recipients of this aid that now is sacrosanct and can't be challenged as the successors to the American Minutemen. Now, the Minutemen of American Revolutionary War fame, not all those guys were pure-hearted either. You can go read some pretty wild histories of the stuff that they were up to. But that's not really the point. The point is that you invoke their legacy to, again, interweave American historical mythology with the this mythological version of what's been going on in Ukraine. 
And that tells the average viewer, not that they're paying that much attention, (laughs) frankly, but let's say they are watching this on a weekday afternoon and they see that analogy invoked, they're going to say to themselves, wow, Trump must be really bad if he doesn't want to give aid to those people. Never mind that Congress... uh, finally, after years of delay, barred the provision of aid to Azov Battalion in 2018. And so all of this really reflects on, like I said, the function of these hearings, which is basically just depicting Trump as an impediment to the conduct of U.S. foreign policy as envisioned by these career national security officials and diplomats, as if their record is just totally unblemished and they have nothing to account for, such as (laughs) presenting this warped version of Ukrainian history where the Azov Battalion are somehow heroes. And I mentioned earlier in the video this idea of... Trump withholding aid to Ukraine and that being this horrendous affront to decency, supposedly. Well, another thing that if you listened to the hearing, you probably would have seen, or at least if you paid attention, is that the aid kind of wasn't ever really withheld in any tangible sense. So let me play another clip. Gentlemen, I appreciate y'all's decade of service as the fabled Foreign Service Officer, Ambassador Ryan Crocker says, because we have pumps and wingtips on the ground, meaning diplomats, that prevents us from having the need to have boots on the ground in the military. Y'all are an important role in our national security, and thank you and your colleagues. Uh, Mr. Taylor, my my first questions are to you, and and these are questions that um, uh, are on years prior to your time in the Ukraine, but I'm pretty sure you can answer them. Um, Did the Ukrainians get military, uh, get aid in FY17? Did they get any aid in FY17? Yes, sir, they they did get assistance. And they they got security assistance as well? They did. And if I said that number was circa, you know, in military assistance around 270 million, would that probably be accurate? Mr. Close. King, about, about right. No. Did they get um, um, aid in FY18? Yes, sir. All, including security assistance. Including security right. assistance. We've already talked about the Javelins, the anti-tank missiles that they were not able to, to purchase in previous administrations. Um, have they gotten security assistance um, in FY19? Yes, sir. Prior to the 400,000 million or so that we're discussing or been discussing a lot here today. Uh, they got some previous year, some probably FY18 assistance, but George, you may know. It takes a while once uh, money is obligated uh, to actually reach the country. There were two island class ships that just arrived in the port of Odessa, sure. uh, and that was with prior year money. So, so there's about a, de- la- my, a lag of a year. Uh, my, year. My point- okay, so understand what that exchange was about. That's Will Hurd, the Republican congressman from Texas, somebody who is relatively outspoken in his criticism of Trump, at least compared to almost every other elected Republican official in the federal government. That's him extracting verification from both impeachment witnesses, George Kent and his co-witness Taylor, that... The military aid that was provisioned to Ukraine has never been interrupted since it was authorized. Or in other words, the military aid that Congress allocated and Trump approved has flowed without obstacle to Ukraine up until the present day, which George Kent underscores by letting everybody know that Two ships just arrived in the port of Odessa thanks to the American taxpayer. So what are we fighting about here? If aid to Ukraine was never jeopardized, notwithstanding the several weeks in the summer of this year when Trump 
and Rudy Giuliani were on their little escapade about investigating the 2016 election and Ukraine's supposed interference therein and the Biden's. All that is sort of a sideshow because guess what? The aid was never in jeopardy. The aid is still (laughs) going because when you allocate money to something, especially a military aid initiative, as Kent specified, there is a lag time of a year. So the aid was never thwarted. And you'd think that somebody in the opposition party or somebody in the media or somebody somewhere, even a guy on the street I would take, would call attention to the fact that Trump promised over the course of his 2016 presidential campaign to forge better ties with Russia. We don't need to hate one another. We want to come up with some modern version of detente. We can cooperate on various things. And yet, he kind of has thrown that all out the window and taken an exceedingly confrontational posture toward Russia, despite the media portrayal, which constantly and tediously depicts him as somehow compromised by Russia. On the contrary, he's flooding Russia's direct sphere of influence, eastern Ukraine, in which they are engaged in, in a hot war of, of sorts, he's flooding that terrain with lethal weaponry, which Barack Obama, to his credit, refused to do over the course of his entire tenure. But that just gets totally forgotten because everybody is too transfixed on this kind of binary hyperpartisan, turbocharged impeachment framework of how to understand these issues. And the result is that U.S. foreign policy is being distorted in a way that prevents the public from understanding what has actually gone on. And it filters everything through this very dubious partisan framework. And I don't know if you followed any of the coverage. Tell me, did you hear anybody remark upon this? I didn't. Did you hear anybody remark upon Kent's claim about the Minutemen and outright fascists being recipients of generous aid in the past? I didn't. So what does that tell you about what all this is achieving? It's not achieving anything particularly good. And sadly, that shall continue in all likelihood. So I'll uh, keep on the lookout for any new depressing developments, keep you updated. And I wrote about this for Real, Real Clear Politics. The column came out yesterday, so I'll link to that. And you should read that for more details. With that, talk to you later.